Welcome back to Hardware Unbox for part two of the June q and I the, think it's June. It's the Stella version. Yeah, it seems to be a bit of a weird one, but I hear that there are some more questions or something. Probably. And apparently we need to be answering them, so... That'd be my best guess. Yeah, let, let's get to that, but before we do... Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Sapphire and their Nitro Plus Radeon RX 7900 XT VaporX 20 gigabyte graphics card. Engineered to be the very best 7900 XT for an incredible 4K gaming experience, the Nitro Plus sports a massive 3.5 slot cooler, complete with a vapor chamber designed to quickly and efficiently move heat away from the GPU. And then dissipating that heat is a massive aluminium heatsink wrapped in an alloy frame and front plate, giving the Nitro Plus a very premium look and feel. Then dressing it up for a bit of flair is a dual ARGB light bar which dons the left and right sides of the card, providing some impressive looking effects that can be controlled via the Trix software. There's loads of other features on offer such as three dual ball bearing fans supporting Quick Connect, a dual BIOS with an OC switch, fuse protection, system fan control and a tough metal backplate to name a few. So to learn more, please click the link in the video description. Alright Tim, I think a slightly controversial question here. Are AMD seemingly blocking certain devs slash publishers from offering DLSS on some sponsored titles? Yeah, I think this has come about from like a, a WCCF tech article where they showed a list of games that sort of had a few more AMD titles that had FSR but not DLSS. And then they got statements from AMD and NVIDIA about whether or not they allow, you know, their sponsored games to use um, you know, the opposition technology. And it seemed, that article seemed to make you jump to a few conclusions. I thought the statements were a bit more inconclusive than perhaps was presented there. But yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just run through what the sort of, because I've asked this question to both AMD and NVIDIA multiple times, not just about, you know, how DLSS and FSR, you know, whether they're, you they don't want the opposition tech to be included, but just about the sponsorship of games in general. Like, how does that work? Um, you can take this with a grain of salt, I guess, but they both had a pretty similar explanation in that when a game is sponsored, it's sort of this, it's not a money transaction. So it's not like there's a actual money being changed hands or a check being written or something. It comes down into, you know, AMD or NVIDIA want their technology integrated into games. So they provide what they've described as development resources to the game developers. That will be their own team of People who are familiar with game development, they'll go to these studios and they'll provide some assistance, which you know includes improving the game and making it work on their GPUs, but also typically integrating features. And what the game companies get back in return is advertising of their games. So this will be through the GeForce or Radeon websites. It will be when they're marketing new GPUs, they'll talk about you know their sponsored games. So NVIDIA almost always will reference Cyberpunk. AMD has referenced titles like Jedi Survivor, The Last of Us, their sort of games. So that gives additional marketing benefit to those companies. You see it in the driver installers, all those sorts of areas. So I guess some people probably class marketing as, you know, money. It's sort of pseudo money because normally you'd have to pay for that sort of marketing. So in some senses, it is being paid for, but not with money. Mm -hmm. But at least that's how they've explained it. Now, whether or not you believe them is another matter, um, but that's what they've sort of said to us. So what at least I believe happens with the sort of why why we're getting FSR in some games and you know not DLSS is that when, let's, let's use AMD as an example, when AMD goes to a developer and they they talk to them and they're like, okay, we want you to integrate our features like, like FSR, that's that's the whole conversation. That's where it sort of gets to. And then they're not going to say after that, you should also integrate DLSS. It's going to be mostly focused on, here's why our technologies are really good and why you should use them, and please integrate this. And then it'll be up to the developers to go any further than that, which I think is why we see some games that do have FSR and DLSS that are AMD sponsored, like The Last of Us, and there are some like, Jedi Survivor where they aren't. So I guess it's a matter of how persuasive AMD is about how things like FSR, you know, you wouldn't need to include DLSS as well. So again, similar with NVIDIA, they'd be talking about, you know, why why you need to integrate DLSS, why it's awesome. And then they're not going to go and say integrate FSR, which again, there are a lot of NVIDIA titles as well, which I think was a bit lost in that WCCF tech article where some games today only use DLSS and there are others where 
DLSS was only integrated weeks or typically months after the launch of the game. So it'll launch with DLSS and then it'll take many months for FSR support to be integrated. So that's at least the best explanation I have because it's not like a de you know developers come out and said, we've got this contract and evidence that shows that AMD is blocking you know, the integration of DLSS and here's the terms in the document that we've signed. It doesn't seem like that's really happened, but it's more on the sort of, I don't know, like I said, how persuasive they are. And I think in some cases they're a bit more persuasive than others. Yeah, exactly. We can't say for sure what's going on there. Um, we don't, we don't want to say nothing's going on there. We don't want to make out that AMD is being all good because we have criticized the GameWorks program in the past when that used to be mm -hmm. going back quite a while now. But yeah, if there there is a bit of a trend there, but as you say, it sort of goes both ways where there's NVIDIA sponsored titles that don't necessarily get great support for, for Radeon GPUs or FSR. Yeah, I, I wonder how different that relationship is compared to like us reviewers with like, you know, people say in a way we get paid with free samples and mm. things like that. And we've had instances in the past where we've been tried to, they've tried to strong arm us into doing certain things. Obviously there was the NVIDIA thing, which is quite famously known at this point, but we've had other companies say to us, you know, you're not going to be supported. You're not going to be part of the review program if you don't attend this event and do this and do that. And we've always just said, well, we're definitely not doing that and we'll make it all public. And then they quickly change their tune <laughs> and say, okay, well, whatever you want. So maybe it's a bit the same on the developer publisher side. Some of them are like, nope, um, we're happy to work with you and get you know this, but we're also not going to shun our RTX you know, users. We're going to provide DLSS support on our own back. Um, and if you don't like that tough luck and the name, it sort of goes, oh, well, you know, it's a, it's a big title game. We want to have our name on it. So we'll sort of... We'll do you know, with that, yeah, right? Yeah, there, there's no real contract or anything. It's more a, we would like you not to do this, but they're like, well, we're going to do that. And then that's sort of the end of it. Yeah. Which is, you know, that happens to us all the time. We'd like you not to do this or we'd like you to do that. And we're like, well, we're not doing that. And they sort of go, ah, well, okay then. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's, it's going to be very much relationship dependent. Like, mm -hmm. I guess it will depend, you know, how closely those relationships are within a company. Like, I would imagine in a lot of circumstances, some of the developers are quite close with their AMD slash NVIDIA, you know, developers that come on to work the game. And often if you look in the credits, there will be developers from AMD, Intel and NVIDIA credited in games because they do genuinely support them via, mm -hmm. via various bits of work. So, yeah, I mean, I guess in some circumstances, the relationship will be good enough and they can suggest some of those things on the sly. But, you know, when we're talking about blocking and prohibiting, it's to me, that sort of suggests like a contractual obligation there where the sponsorship happens, therefore the contract terms say you can't integrate DLSS, whereas at least even the evidence that we can see with games that are AMD sponsored that do have both FSI and DLSS, it suggests to me that is more what you're suggesting where it really comes down to the developer, the relationship, and what's being suggested. Um with that said, I think there's some pretty major publishers and developers that are creating games like Jedi Survivor, which is published by EA, which is obviously a major major publisher, and developed by Respawn, which is a major AAA studio, that I would have thought they'd be able to you know, just say to AMD, well, we're going to put DLSS in this game anyway. You know, It's an Unreal Engine game. It should be very easy to integrate DLSS. So there's really, you know, as much as we're sitting here saying, I don't think that it's a contractual obligation written into the contracts when the sponsorship happens that they can't integrate DLSS. It's not saying that I'm excusing that behavior because I'm not. 100% all AAA major games have the development resources today to integrate DLSS and FSR, every single one of them. Yeah, Star Wars Jedi Survivor should Jedi have. Jedi Survivor is a massive game. Should have had what DLSS. What are they doing? Should have DLSS. And that's the other thing that might eventually get it which is even more annoying. It's a single-player game. Yeah, people want to play stage, it day one. That's what, people who have paid for it, especially the people who paid early on, they, they didn't get to enjoy the game with DLSS, which you know can really enhance the frame rate. So that's mm -hmm. frustrating. Yeah, so... Yeah, it's a bit of a bit of an interesting one. I certainly think... I mean, what makes Jedi Survivor even worse is Unreal Engine, which, mm -hmm. as far as I'm aware, requires either a plug-in or it's just a checkbox in the engine itself to enable DLSS. You sure. probably need to do some mm -hmm. minor tweaking to choose the right presets, get it working nicely, but we're not talking about m heaps of work. No, it shouldn't be. Especially if FSR 2.2 or you know, 2 has already been integrated where you, know, you need things like motion vectors up and working already. So... You know, I think it's unacceptable that these games don't launch with with both of 
Yep. I mean, we've talked about development resources in the past, but really, if you're integrating one, you should put in the effort to integrate all of them. And it is disappointing that there are some AMD games that only have FSR, and there are some NVIDIA games that only have DLSS. I think these days, though, I, I think it's fair to sort of point out more the finger at AMD because there are, I think NVIDIA sort of, there's more titles that have both yeah, they're NVIDIA sponsor that is supporting all technologies or at least do eventually get um, FSR support, whereas there are certainly games that have FS... Like, you can go back and look at Far Cry 6, which doesn't even have FSR 2 from memory. It's only FSR 1, which is mm. quite embarrassing for them. But anyway, it's those sort of games where really that should have, like, a major U Ubisoft title should probably mm. have mm -hmm. DLSS in it. So, yeah, it's a bit, bit disappointing there, but, I mean... This this sort of behavior has gone back a long way with both companies sort of... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nothing new. Trying to integrate their features. We had Hairworks as sort of a thing that happened previously where this was sort of a major thing that, you know, Hairworks didn't necessarily run very well on AMD GPUs and... Yeah, it was physics before that. Things like that. So, yeah, this sort of developer and AMD slash NVIDIA relationship has been going on for a long time. But, yeah, I mean... If there is evidence out there suggesting that there is a contract being signed that says, you know, you are not allowed to integrate NVIDIA features when AMD is sponsoring a game, I'd, I'd love to see the evidence of that. Um, so if there is someone out there that's a game developer watching this and has some inside info on that, I'd, I'd love to hear it. But yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it's an interesting one. I hope, it, I hope this will improve more because it's one of those things that sort of, it's being talked about a lot now. Mm -hmm. Like people are sort of not, really accepting the situation where games do not integrate all these technologies and it feels like more and more games that you know are going are either going neutral things like hogwarts legacy for example was not really a sponsored title that integrated all technology and i think it's moving more towards that so hopefully we see more of that continue mm -hmm. with many games being released in very poor state and being patched frequently are you considering changing your approach to what games to cover and when to avoid constantly throwing data and time away or do you think that kind of content performs well to be worth the extra mile of work? Uh, well, we're not thinking of changing anything there because as I've talked about time and time again, this has been an ongoing issue for as long as I've been testing games. There's you know, been games that have major issues that are still worth looking at because you guys want to play them. Uh, so yeah, nothing nothing will really change there on our end. Of course, if the game is completely broken and, and garbage, then we you know, there's, there are a lot of games we don't test because it just turns out it's not worth it. But if it's like a, a Cyberpunk 2077 where it's like massively popular and everyone's hyped about it and that and people want us to test it, then sort of regardless of the condition of the game, we'll test it. Uh, but it, it's a tough one. Like even like The Last of Us Part 1, like I played that game on, I think it was a Core i7 13700K with a Radeon RX 6800. Weird combo, but I was testing something. I thought I'll just, I'll just play through the game and find somewhere good to benchmark. Played through that game for, I think it was about three or four hours, maybe a bit longer. It ran great. Like my frame time graph was buttery smooth. I didn't run into any bugs. I'm not saying the game didn't have any bugs. I'm just saying I didn't run into any in my initial three, four hour playthrough. And the performance was pretty good. Pretty great, really. No stuttering. Looked great on Ultra. Thought it was good. And then, you know, you start putting in eight gigabyte cards and it's crap. And I'm not saying it, it should have run necessarily as bad as it did or been as VRAM hungry as it was. But again, I guess I'm sort of getting sidetracked with this one a bit, but if we had hardware that wasn't right on the edge, like if we weren't having eight gigabyte mid-range graphics cards for, I don't know how many years we've been doing that for now. Eight. Um, if we hadn't been I doing think. that for eight years, then a lot of these games, if, if all you guys had played uh, The Last of Us Part 1 when it was first released on a 16 gigabyte graphics card or even a 12 gigabyte graphics card, you wouldn't have really had any performance related issues, I don't believe. Like I saw people with 6700 XTs playing the mm. game just fine. Probably you would have CPU was good enough. There was sure, some CPU. Side sure, things. but I mean a relatively new CPU you played the game pretty well, I'm pretty sure. But there were bugs in the game, right? Falling through the floor, the usual crap that, you know, mm -hmm. Battlefield 2042 yep. type stuff. You were still going to run into that, so that's unacceptable and that sucks, but it would have been they could have focused on fixing those things rather than trying to make the game work on eight gigabyte cards. So, yeah. It, it, you would have had to update your data as often then? <laughs> well, yeah. So, so all I'm getting at is it's tough to know, you know, 
how badly broken some games are depending on you know the hardware like for spoken again it's another game where if you have enough vram the game actually looks a lot better like i remember playing it initially on an eight gigabyte card and just thinking wow this is awful how was this released like i was blown away by how bad the game looked the muddy textures and everything i, I just thought that's how the game looked and surely a lot of people thought that's how the game looked because they, I think so. Because, I think they've fixed other areas of the game too, haven't they? Um, they've it, it the the handling of the textures is a bit more intelligent now. So when you like look at a certain area, it'll give you the it'll and it'll dump the texture quality elsewhere, and you can still if you move around quickly, you can see it doing mm-hmm. the texture swapping. I think they've improved things like shadows as well. Like kind of, I'm sure it's, that's a digital foundry question. Ask I'm, them. I'm sure it's been improved <laughs> since release. But when I first played it, I think it was on a uh, 3070 Ti or something like that, and I couldn't believe how bad it looked. And then I put in the 4070. I'm like, hang on a minute. This de- this wall here definitely looks a lot better than it did previously. And you know, I'm and again, I'm not saying that necessarily that's how the game should have shipped, but also eight gigabyte graphics cards. It's just a bit of a tough one there to to work out. And I think we're going to sit. Well, we're seeing a lot more of it, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Yep. All righty, Tim. Is the RX 7600 worth existing? <laughs> Let's question its existence. As a super budget class GPU, okay, its price will go below $200 eventually. It's headed that way. Yeah, it's hard to argue with, I suppose, based on like RX 6600 type stuff. Anyway, but even if it went down to $180, uh, is a 1080p 8 gigabyte card a good investment, especially when compared to a 6700 XT or equivalent 12 gigabyte card? We'll see. I don't want to get, again, too much in the VRAM thing because that comes up a lot, but affordable graphics cards having eight gigabytes of VRAM is perfectly acceptable. That's fine. We've never been against that. We were more like, hey, this $500 card and this $600 card that only had eight gigabytes of VRAM that we said is probably going to be problematic within a few years kind of turned out to be. But the lower end cards that had eight gigabytes of VRAM, we we weren't setting our sights on those. Like we, we are, I, I feel reasonable and realistic with how much VRAM we think a card should have at a certain price point. Like eight gigabytes on a $400 GPU in 2023, garbage, should have never happened. $300 GPU, it's like not great. Yeah, you can make a case for it and you can make a case against it. Yeah, $200, it's like, hey, that's what I'd expect. That's fine. So 7,600, it's already down to 250. Uh, 250. It yep. just hit 250, which at 250 is pretty good product. Like, you know... I. I wouldn't be shouting from the rooftops about how amazing it is, but mm-hmm. pretty good. Like, Yeah, and I think part of this question was like, should you invest in like a higher tier model? And often for people in the buying in the $200 range, it's not really an option of choosing between a $200 card and like a $300 to $350 card. Yeah, it's like $350. If, for... you, if you had $350 to spend, you would just probably buy the $350 card. So, <laughs> and then if you're going to spend three hundred fifty dollars, you know, six hundred dollars does get you a much more powerful GPU now. So, yeah, but I mean, yeah, you can make that <laughs> where, do you, argument. where do you stop? You can make that argument well up the chain. But yeah, Nvidia's I mean, like they're falling into our cunning plan here. Before they know <laughs> it, they'll be buying a forty ninety. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, seventy six hundred and entry level cards having a gig of RAM is is fine. Yeah. I, I mean, it's there, there has to be compromises when mm-hmm. you're talking about entry tier products. Yeah. And this is supposed to be not really at $270, but a $200 or a hundred, what does it say? $180. So if it dropped down to $180, is that a good investment? That would be an amazing investment. Yeah. That product for $180 would be fair. Look, if, if AMD had have released the 7,600 at $180, it'd be all anyone would be talking about and recommending. It'd be the card to get. Yeah. It's much faster than the 6,600 at the same price, but I think as well people forget about how popular 1080p gaming still is for for mainstream slash entry level gamers. Like a lot of you know mid mid range for sure on like a 4060 Ti, 1440p is almost certainly the resolution people will be targeting there. Mm-hmm. But 1080p is not dead. Like for mm-hmm. entry level gaming, there are still monitors that are around $150 US. You know, you can't get 1440p that cheap. So even today, there are circumstances where buying new 1080p displays makes sense and new 1080p GPUs make sense. But it is entry level. Like it That's can't, right. It can't be $400, but for $200, 1080p is is the thing. And yep. yeah, sure, you're not investing in a card that can play 1440p ultra settings, but 1080p 
it's still a thing. It's still if you're what paying, a lot of people play. If at. you're getting a brand new current generation GPU for two hundred dollars and you're spending one hundred fifty dollars on the monitor, I think that's a pretty good gaming combo. But then if you're spending three hundred dollars on your GPU, do you want to be playing at 1080p? Well, we did a poll, and I think it was like fifty five percent of people said no. Um, they'd want to be playing at 1440p. So that's roughly half mm-hmm. of you agree that if you're spending $300, you'd want 1440p, which I think is reasonable. That's what I'd be targeting for, for that sort of Yeah, and I think tier. as time goes on, you're more likely to be wanting to play at 1440p mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. as opposed to 1080, like your next monitor is probably going to be an upgrade to 1440 from 1080. But yeah, 1080 is not dead, I guess, is basically the point that I was trying to make there. So mm-hmm. yeah. Why do you think AIB partners are allergic to making standard width cards? What is a standard width card anymore? I suppose it's whatever the uh, Founders Edition slash reference card would be, which would be dual slot these days. Uh, I, If I had to guess, I would say it's because of you guys. It's because of what people buy. So, like, to get off on a tangent here, I cannot stand, I loathe the plastic backplate. The worst thing. It's so bad. But it, I'm fighting a, a losing battle in this one, right? Plastic b- back plates are just dumb, okay? Because they trap heat. They, they're they terrible at conducting heat. They're just bad. They, they There's nothing. There's no real good thing about a plastic back plate. They do more harm than good, you know? But aesthetics, Steve. Well, that you could argue that they protect the back of the card. It's like, what are you doing that the back of your graphics card needs that much protection? Well, when I'm gaming, I like to make sure I touch the PCB because yeah. <laughs> that, that's really good, especially with metal objects Tim, Tim like Sora, screwdrivers. Tim Sora, do not touch hot surface once, and now he's like, I've just got to touch every graphics card yeah, since I saw much. that. Uh, but, yeah, they're just, they're just dumb. They suck. So I um, MSI... Um, I've gone to them a few times and been like, guys, stop doing this. It sucks. Why do you do it? And they're like, well, I won't, I won't quote them um, officially. And I can't remember exactly what they said, but it was along the lines of, yeah, um, we do it because it sells graphics cards, which is probably obvious. It makes sense. But they're like, gamers want backplates. If we release a card, a budget card without a backplate, we get wrecked. Like people get very upset that it doesn't have a backplate, but we don't have the budget to put a full-size aluminium backplate on there, the plastic costs nothing. We heard Roman DeBauer talking about this, like the difference to put the the wire view in an, yep. in an aluminium case opposed to plastic. Plastic was literal cents, like a couple of cents, whereas the aluminium cost you know, significantly more. Buys to coolers as well. People want the bigger, cooler, quieter, cooler-looking stuff, and that sacrifices on the size. You know, you get bigger products, and if well, that's what people are buying. Like, if you look at a whole bunch of models on a website, and you see there's the big one the high, or the yeah. small one at the same price, you'd be like, well, the big one probably is a bit cooler. So then that's what people it buy. It looks cooler as well. You're not and using the slots a lot of the time in your motherboard. Well, so that's yeah, that's right. You have this space a lot of the time, so mm. pe- that's what people go for because they're like, well, I'm not using that room. May as well make the cooler bigger. And yep. if you think about reviews and stuff, what are we normally looking at? Like, we're looking at operating temperatures... We're looking at operating volume, uh, mm-hmm. how well it cools the you know the, the memory, the VRM, the GPU, and bigger coolers are just better at doing that. So if if gamers are more drawn to the bigger, more impressive looking card, that's going to generate more sales and it's going to look better in reviews. It seems pretty obvious why they're doing it. Yep. Oh, well, this is interesting. A question here from our video editor, Balin. And Balin asks, why is the last 20 minutes or so of the Q&A missing the A-roll? And why do I have to fill in random B-roll over all of that audio? Well, good question, Bale. Let me quickly explain to you and the audience what happened here. So Tim and I filmed an hour of the Q&A. We hit pause on the camera and the audio recorder. We copied that data off as we normally do. And then we set out to film another hour. We got an hour and two minutes into filming and the Panasonic GH6 camera, which we were using, just turned off. We were using the DC power because the battery usually doesn't last that long. Camera turned off and we get a corrupt movie file, MOV file. Unrepairable, tried all the various different ways of trying to repair it. Couldn't salvage that hour and two minutes of filming, which we've never had that problem before with the GH6. Anyway, decided let's just suck it up. We won't be lazy, we'll just do the whole hour and something again because well that's what we've got to do so we filmed 20 minutes and everything went well we stopped the camera and we decided to continue on we went for another 42 minutes and before we were on the very last question halfway through it and the camera turned off again so i think we've got a bad power pack not sure 
But either way, the Panasonic GH6 isn't suitable for those long form videos. If something like that happens, you, you can't, it doesn't run off battery. So, it, I mean, it does run off battery, but if you want to run it off mains power, the mains power adapter thing goes in where the battery is and there's no backup power. So long story short, Tim uses a Blackmagic Cinema Pocket 4K camera thing. I've bought one of those for the Q&As. And so we shouldn't have this problem moving forward again. So that explains why the next 20 minutes or so of, well, the end of part two and part three will just be kind of like a podcast with a random B-roll over it. Hope that's okay. We were just going to scrap it and not do a part three, but we've decided, well, we answered the questions. You guys are mostly here for the audio. So hopefully that's okay. If not, stop the video here and we're done. Bye. Will the current AM5 boards support high memory clocks in the future? Like let's say Zen 6 sweet spot is say 8,000 RAM. Will all the boards run that or is there a way to tell? Unfortunately, there's no way to tell. I think, as you know, the person that asked the question, the limitation on current AM5 motherboards is the CPUs, not the motherboards themselves. And the boards that struggle with DDR5-6000, again, that wasn't necessarily the board. There may be some lightly layered boards that have some sort of signaling issues there that, you know, compromise the, the signal integrity of DDR5 memory, which may lower the frequency. Not sure on that one, but I'd say the decent quality boards are are limited by the IMC, so the integrated memory controller on the Ryzen processor and not their ability to run at higher frequencies. And we've seen that, you know, again, pretty much all the Intel boards run like DDR5 7200 just fine. I know there's some questioning around how stable they are, but again, that would be on the IMC side, not so much the board side. 8,000, that's a very high frequency. It's just a massive unknown. Unfortunately, there's just no way to tell at this point in time, at least with what we have available. Maybe motherboard manufacturers would know if the signal integrity is good enough so that if the CPU could do it. But yeah, current Ryzen CPUs just can't do it. We, we know that the SOC voltage needs to be jacked up and when you do that, you risk frying the CPU. So that is the limitation there. If, if uh, AMD is able to refine that for Zen 6, then maybe. Yep. With Harbor Unboxed, fast approaching 1 million subscribers. How will you celebrate it? I don't know how fast we're actually approaching it. It's pretty slow going at the moment on the platform. Uh, I know a lot yep. of YouTubers have complained, or at least in the tech scene, of slow growth. Um, and we've definitely slowed down. But I think we'll be there by this time next year at the, at the very least. Maybe get there this year. It's just subscriber count on YouTube is a bit pointless these days. It's not, it's not that relevant. It's not super relevant. Uh, I mean, it, it is to a degree, obviously, but it's not as relevant as it once was. I mean... There are tech channels with many more subscribers than we have that get less views than us. And there's some guys with less subscribers than we have that get more views than us. So, and it's really all about views. That's the, the currency of YouTube, I guess. Uh, yeah. But we're happy with where we're at. It's all going well. Uh, we could pretty much stay where we are now indefinitely and still have a good time. So, yep. uh, but yeah, as for the million subscriber mark, I guess it's a, a milestone. But yeah, like I said, it's not what it used to be. And we also don't really care. So yep. you don't care, do you? No, not really. No. Um, as you said, the the metrics in YouTube, you do sort of see it. But yeah, things like, you know, with the algorithm these days on YouTube, I mean, it, your homepage is all, that's where most people watch their videos from. And that's just a whole selection of subscribed and non-subscribed creators. Seems so, to change at least every six months on how it works anyway. Yeah. So. But yeah, no, we'll, um, I don't think we'll do anything to celebrate it, really. Maybe we'll do like some sort of live stream build type thing, but we do them anyway from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, we'll probably just, yep. yeah, we don't really care. We're not, we're not hyped for it. It'll be nice, but yep, whatever. Why does it take so long for AMD to release the rest of the RDNA 3 stack? Uh, I think there's probably two main reasons here, and they sort of tie into one another a bit. I'd say the first reason being that RDNA 3 just hasn't worked out as well as AMD had planned. I think that was pretty clear with their like 6950 XT versus, uh, was it the 700 XT or 700 XTX? One of those. Anyway, their, their metrics were a fair bit off, like 10, 15% off what they were targeting. So a bit of underperforming there. And then that has a knock-on effect down the stack. Um, so your problem is you've got 6950 XTs for like, what, $610 or something? Are they going to be able to beat that with a 7800 XT? Probably not. Uh, it would be very similar. And if they do beat it, it would be to the degree that just doesn't make it worthwhile. 
Uh, and then you've got 60, 700 XTs that are still very cheap there, down around 350, if I recall correctly. So that's probably why they went for the 7600. They went from one extreme to the other, also to counter the 4060 series, which is probably the more relevant release, or most recent release anyway, from NVIDIA. So basically it comes down to RDNA 3 not being as impressive as they would have hoped at that sort of performance mm -hmm. price segment, and the fact that they've got boatloads of RDNA 2 GPUs that are similar in terms of performance that they've got to get rid of. So, Yeah. I mean, previous generations you would have seen if AMD had dropped the price of the 6900 XT from $1,000 to $600, it would have sold out instantly. Gone. Like They would have been gone. And that opens up the opportunity for the new model to be released into the market without that sort of reviewers aren't going to be talking about get this or the 6900 XT. They're just going to be like, well, this is the new model. It's replacing the old one. You can't buy that anymore. It's competing with the NVIDIA equivalent or whatever. And that's the situation. Mm -hmm. um, but because the you know AMD and NVIDIA made so many previous generation models, there's still a lot of these cards still floating around, especially at least for AMD. It seems like most of the stack is still available. I think the there's a few models like 6800, 6800 XT that supply isn't amazing, but there's still you know plenty of other models available by the sounds of things, and you can see that at most retailers. So yeah, they just, I mean, imagine something like a 7800 XT. If that was only, let's say, 15% faster than a, a 6900 XT, and they launched it at a similar price to the 6950 XTs today, it's not going to be received super well. Whereas if that card was no longer available, then maybe they they're sort of would get a better reception from it. So I think they're waiting. They're sort of hedging a little bit, like how long can we wait before RDNA 3 is irrelevant, but also we need to make sure that you know our previous gen stock is has run out. It, they've, they've put themselves in a tough position. I mean, that's what happens though. You enjoy the good times during the cryptocurrency boom, you make mad bank, but it comes back to bite you. And that's what's happened because again, at 7800 XT, who cares? Because if it comes in, power efficiency is not going to really be much better. It'll be a little bit better, but not world's better. Comes in, it delivers 6950 XT performance, let's say, for a small mm -hmm. discount. It's like, it's it's a better product. It's mildly better. But how long has the 6950 XT been affordable for? Like at, at that a while. Price? Has it been six months plus? So yeah, six months. So really, you would have been better off, I think it's six to nine months. So you would have been better off buying that card six to nine months ago and enjoyed an extra six to nine months of basically the same performance for basically the same price. It's hard to put a value figure on that, right? Yeah, I mean, I've always thought, well, I've been starting to think more on the sort of what's going to incentivize or convince someone to upgrade. And by that, I mean, you know, we're talking about people who are waiting versus people who are upgrading. Mm -hmm. So if someone has seen a 6950 or 6900 XT for $600 and they've gone, not interested, not going to buy that. I'll continue waiting for a product to come along. And they get a 10% improvement. And they get a that, yeah, 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 10, 15% improvement at the same price. Even if there wasn't the 6950 XT on the market, like they're all sold out, you're sort of thinking, is that person going to change their mind from waiting to upgrading? And unless there was some new games coming out that really forced an upgrade on that person, like the card they had is no longer adequate, doesn't run games, now, now I have to consider the the... The decision, if it's just someone that's waiting for that good product to come along, that is certainly not going to be yeah, convincing. Like if you could buy an RTX 4090 a year ago, like if you could have bought it a mm -hmm. year ago for the same price as today, but 10% slower, what would you do? Would you enjoy an additional 12 months of a 10% slow 4090? Or would you wait 12 months to pay the same price to get the 10% more? Yeah, I mean, you obviously want the, to enjoy it over that twelve months. Because if you're only gonna if you're gonna enjoy that roughly that performance for say three years, now you've got four. Yeah, that's way better value. So, again, that's why the seventy six hundred sucks. You could have bought the six six fifty XT ten months ago for slightly less or about the same, and yep. got the same <laughs> performance, same VRAM, pretty much same power usage. It's the same, same experience. Features. You could have got the same experience twelve or almost twelve months prior, roughly twelve months prior. So yep. that's why this generation sucks. Yep, pretty much. All righty, Tim, you've been doing a bit of GPU pricing updating and whatnot. What is the cheapest 1440p GPU that doesn't suck? And I have to emphasize doesn't mm. suck there. So we're going to have to cross off a lot of options because I would say today, if 
you're buying a brand new card for 1440p gaming that you should not consider something with 8 gig of memory. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the cheapest products on the market have 8 gig of memory. Mm -hmm. So 6650 XT and below from AMD all have 8 gig, 7600, 8 gig, 460 Ti and below 8 gig. There's the so previous gen models like 3070 Ti and down or 8 gig, except for the 3060. 3060, yeah, but it's too but it's expensive. And not, for what not it is. really a 1440. I mean, it's, performance is good, but. It's, no, it's just. A, so, really, what, 6700 XT based on that? There's the 6700, which is 10 gig, but I think at this point you might as well. I'd rather have the 12 gig card personally. I think so. The 6700 is quite cheap. I think it's quite a bit cheaper than. I, I have to it's not available pricing. in Australia, which is a problem. That is an issue. So, but yeah, 6700 XT is probably the cheapest non 8 gigabyte card on the market at the moment, mm -hmm. especially because Intel's Arc A770 16 gig is now being discontinued. Not that I necessarily would have recommended it, but that was at least an option. Um, doesn't, you know, Intel's officially discontinued it, I believe. So yeah, that leaves the 6700 XT is probably. Well, it's really the only option. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's got it's, performance that's good enough for 1440p. I think it's the same price or cheaper than an RTX 3060 at the moment. The RTX 3060 has just got a pretty substantial cut to like 270. Oh, US. really? Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, that that was to usher in the 4060. So that would be about $80, che $70 cheaper? So they're about but the, like $78 the, cheaper? The lowest 6700 XT prices I've seen are like $310. Oh, so if okay. we're going best versus best, okay. it's like maybe a $40 to $50 difference. In that case, you'd definitely get the 6700 XT. Yeah, I would have thought so. Definitely. Because um, it's two two tiers above at least. Yeah, I mean, it's a faster card. So mm. yeah, that's prob probably what you would go with. But yeah, the, it's, it's a hard discussion because... Yeah, just most of the cards, you sort of think about the longevity and issues with 8 gig at 1440p. I mean, if you said 1080p, it would be like, yeah, okay, go out and get an RX 6600 or something. The only um, caveat to this discussion is the fact that if you're talking about competitive gaming, yes, CSGO, mm -hmm. Apex Legends, Fortnite, 8 gigabytes at 1440p is plenty for those games. Especially if you're True, using even, like, yep. even Warzone and stuff, if you're using competitive quality settings... So, yeah, if we're talking about multiplayer games, especially those that are going to be played in the sort of competitive quality setting modes, mm -hmm. then... I think you could probably max out Fortnite. It wouldn't use more than 8 gig of VRAM, would it? Uh, it would at... It would, but uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't play Fortnite maxed out if you mm -hmm. want to actually win a game. So Sure, I mean, that's fair. so. So competitive multiplayer games, 8 gigabytes is fine. We're really where it becomes a problem is the single player games like you know, The Last of Us Part yeah. One. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, if you're after an esports card, I mean, then again, a lot of esports games don't require heaps of performance either. So at 1440p, you can probably shift a couple of tiers down. If you're it depends on the games you're playing, of course. I mean, bang um, for your buck, the 6700x is probably the way to go anyway. So sure, yeah. yeah. But I mean, if you're playing CS:GO, I mean, you could probably get away with the 6600 or. Yeah, you're probably less concerned. I was going to say a lower tier card, but I'm not recommending 6500 XT to anyone. Don't do that. <laughs> so, yeah, no, don't yeah. do that. We'll have to end the show. <laughs> uh, yeah. So 6700 XT is what we're landing on? I think right now it's probably too good to pass up at mm -hmm. 310 to 350 US. I, I don't think there's anything that competes with it there. So yeah, I think good we'll value. Go All right, Tim, I think this is one uh, probably addressed towards you or maybe exclusively you. Do you plan, I think this is Tim, the return of game optimization series because after tweak guide and nvidia tweak sites are closed down and empty i think we need some guidance to optimize games other than the geforce experience uh, the graphs and visual comparisons were very helpful and useful to get the best visual and performance experience from games especially as some settings cost so much performance for so little difference visually yeah so i mean just very quickly, the reason why I stopped doing game optimization guides is that the the primary reason was that for some games, most games, the conclusion usually came down to you should be playing on high settings with some settings turned up to ultra. Most of the time that, that meant high settings with like ultra textures and maybe a few other settings um, that made the most sense. So for a lot of games, optimization guides weren't really relevant um, outside of very brief recommendations, which made the whole video kind of pointless in some regards. And the second thing was that a lot of the testing, especially as games of today are more complex than back when we were talking about them, there's sort of bottlenecks in more areas now, more a, more, a larger variety of areas than there were back then. So back when I was doing them, the GPU tended to be almost always the limiting factor, which meant that we can go through all the, use one CPU, go through all the 
settings, look at how they scale on GPUs, and we can sort of say with confidence that you can turn down a few settings and get better performance. If you're, I did that with a game like Jedi Survivor or Hogwarts Legacy or something like that, you would have seen that on maybe on my system, which you maybe use the high-end CPU, we turn down some of the settings and we get good GPU scaling, but then on your system with a much weaker CPU, you're actually CPU bottlenecked. As well, you, we've talked extensively on this channel about VRAM, so potentially as well, I could say, hey, crank textures up to ultra, but you have a, a 3070, in which case ultra textures isn't relevant. So I think there's gonna be, I do wanna bring this sort of content back around major game launches, because I think there is some value in giving people those guides of like, what are the settings that make the most difference? But we're just gonna have to approach it in a bit of a different way, like changing the sort of configurations that we do most of our benchmarking on to maybe something a bit more mid-range. So where we may run into all those limitations, like, and then we can talk about turn down these settings to improve your CPU performance, turn down this for GPU, maybe turn down this for VRAM. I think they'll be much more useful. Now, to do that sort of testing, we we'll probably have to sacrifice a few other things. So maybe we won't talk as much about some of the, the settings that make no difference. But yeah, there seems to definitely be demand there. And I think there's a better way of going about than what I was doing because it always felt like, you know, I make this content, I'm sort of happy with it, but it felt like for some people, like how relevant is this guide if you're super CPU limited? And I'm recommending, like I almost always recommend like the ultra level of detail settings. So mm -hmm. like crank that way up because it looks better. And if you have enough VRAM and CPU resources, it came with like very little performance hit. But then these days we've got games where on mid-range CPUs, you're struggling to run it on like medium level of detail settings. So as I said, there'll be a better, smarter way of going about that. I'm sort of thinking about what's the best way of doing that. Um, and yeah, we'll try bring it back for some of the bigger titles towards the end of this year. Nice. All right, and that does us for part two of the June Q&A series. Part one is also on the channel if you want to go back and listen to, I think we called it acceptable and this one is more i think more we're, stellar this was stellar that was acceptable yeah. yep yeah so it's stellar this one we're gonna do a part three though right oh geez Might so be. i don't know what to call that yeah i don't know it's a wait and see on that one yeah the leftovers <laughs> the leftovers um well we don't want to downplay that episode okay no it's gonna be people a, to watch it's it. gonna be phenomenal it'll yeah. be i don't even know i don't have words to describe how good it's going to be so just make sure you, you just stay trust around. us on that one. Yep. I think just um, queue it up, ready to go if it's already out. And mm -hmm. Yeah, take a look. But apart from that, we've got Float Plane, Patreon, oh, yeah, a supporter, mm -hmm. supporters. It's always mm -hmm. nice to thank those people for supporting the channel. If you do want to become a member, links are in the description. You gain access to things like our monthly live stream, which by the time this episode's out, we probably would have already done. But next long. month, yep. you'll be able to join up. Um, we've got our Discord community, BTS videos. You can ask us some Q&A questions in there. All sorts of good lots, stuff. Lots of good stuff there. So, yeah. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Tim. I'm your host, Dave. See you in the next one. <laughs>